So what is Second Life? How many, how, how many of you have, have seen or heard something about uh, Second Life on TV? How many of you have actually been inside of Second Life? That's about right. Usually that's the same numbers I get with my classes. Uh, how many of you are slightly afraid or disturbed of what Second Life might be and therefore haven't gone? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Second Life, it, it's not a game. It's a virtual world. It's a virtual world in which uh, you can build and create most anything based on a novel written by Neil Stevenson uh, back in 1992. This interesting novel laid out a, a, a near future in which uh, he described several different technologies, such as a globe that you would sit on your desk and uh, try to zoom in and out of an earth to see what was going on anywhere on that earth. He called it Earth. We call it Google Earth. Uh, likewise, he described a, uh, an online universe in which uh, users would go in and have little characters that uh, would, they would use to pretend to be uh, something else. They, they would create buildings. He called it the metaverse. We call it Second Life. To give you a little bit of an introduction to uh, that concept, let me remind you, this is me. <laughs> this is my avatar. An avatar is your representation within Second Life. Uh, but you don't have to be human. This is a furry. This is a vampire. This is a newbie. In the real world, we have discriminations and, and uh, based on sex or race or that sort of thing. In, uh, in, in Second Life, you, you become discriminated based on if you're a noob or if you are um, a vampire or, or if you have to be a furry or something like that. Uh, it's a very strange, strange world. Um, and for several years, the f first several years, most of it was gambling, which uh, I, I didn't partake in because that's illegal. Betting. Some people go in there and create uh, online relationships. That's not me. Uh, actually, the other one is. I, I got asked to be a, a groomsman at a wedding, so I went for that. It is a strange world, and... When, after ha having sort of explored it for uh, the first six months, which is years ago now, I decided I wanted to try and do something productive within it. And so I built uh, a planetarium. I didn't have a planetarium at Elon University and decided this was my chance to, to have a planetarium. After I'd constructed it, though, uh, something went up in the backyard, uh, a female vampire porn shop. Um, <laughs> And I decided I needed to transplant my planetarium if I was going to send students there. And so I looked for other professors. I searched through the web to try and find any other professors that were doing any sort of education at a university campus, anything. And all I found at that time uh, was a university in which all the professors were 100 years old and all the students were wayward girls. <laughs> and so I decided if there wasn't going to be a campus, that I would create one and approached Linden Labs, the company uh, that had created the Second Life product to set aside a parcel of their world for education. Uh, but actually, that we, we quickly outgrew that, and I ended up tying uh, my planetarium in with a group of people that built this. Some people build model rockets, like little ones about yay big for a living, and some people build vir full-scale virtual rockets on their computers, and that's what we have here. These are This is not NASA. These are people in their own homes that have an interest in space flight, that look up the specs of rockets and build them in excruciating detail. This is the International Space Flight Museum built entirely by volunteers. My planetarium went up on the corner of that virtual island. And this is actually a student show, written, or a show written by my students, where the public showed up. What, what, what I find fascinating here is that, that the public does show up for these sorts of things, that they're, that they're actually willing to stand in line um, virtually to have that communal learning experience with other learners. Wouldn't it be far easier to go to a blog or to go to a nice website or pick up a magazine or, or watch Nova? But they want to not be learning science alone. They want to do that with other people. And so they log on to Second Life to watch a, a fairly mediocre show written by, by, by undergraduate students that aren't even science majors, but to, to do that in an engaged community of learners. Um, I've also been um, trying to test the concept of building virtual uh, telescopes such that uh, you could uh, have students that might break your real telescope practice on the virtual one uh, before going in. This took me, took me about a day to build. Um, 
if you are brave enough to log into Second Life, you might be curious where you can find all the stuff that I've been showing you. This is an island. Uh, each space within Second Life is actually a, a computer, much like the one right here, the one right there, that run, acts as a server for people to log into. You do that all the time when you're surfing the web. But this server runs a virtual island. So when you go to NASA's island, a big chunk of NASA's islands is dedicated to giving presentations that are PowerPoint presentations in a virtual world, which th that doesn't really work in a real classroom. And so I, I hesitate to take that into a virtual classroom. There are a few things that they, that they have done, though, that are simply amazing. For instance, creating the, uh, on one little tiny corner of, of one of NASA's islands, they've got a recreation of uh, the Mars landscape where you can uh, stand there and then you can have like a Mars surveyor, or, or sorry, some of the Mars landers bounce down and go past you. On my own Elon Island, I constructed a, a virtual recreation of the Apollo 11 landing site with full detail, uh, including the American flag, uh, a full-scale model of the LEM, all the science in instruments, the, the map of all the craters. You can walk around. You can put on boots and leave little moon prints behind you as you walk around. It's fascinating. And, and honestly, until I finished building it, I didn't realize how little space Neil, and, uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin had explored when they first got out of, of, of the LEM. The, the subsequent missions explored a huge space, but they just basically got out of the, the van, walked around a little bit, got back in, and came home. Uh, and, and Second Life does a really good job of, of giving you that sense of place. Another project that uh, my students helped in, uh, build as part of their um, final project was during um, the Bali conference, they built a house that they called the Carbon Footprint House. And in the Carbon Footprint House, uh, all the appliances, like your computer or the, the lamps or your coffee maker, have a green gas oozing from them that's proportional to the amount of greenhouse gases uh, emitted by them somewhere else in the world. It, it demonstrates visually what the carbon footprint is. This is an ex excellent example of what you can do in Second Life that you couldn't possibly do in the real world. But again, in this picture, and in the picture I showed you before, you see that the people come there. They, they want to, to stand outside of these exhibits and talk to the builders. It's, that it's not so much of the objects that have been built, but having a chance to in, interact and engage with other members of the, of the audience that are, are interested in the science topic and to talk directly to the, to the science experts. Uh, some of the other things that we have in the silence, uh, uh, up on University of Denver's island, they built a full-scale recreation of their own observatory. The attention to detail is magnificent. Uh, aside from just building a telescope, though, they built the, the living quarters below the telescope. If you've ever been uh, on top of uh, a mountain <laughs> by your, almost by yourself on one of these observatories, it really it, it, it feels like that. It feels exactly like that, the, 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 including the, the trash that they have in the trash can is the sort of thing that, that almost any scientist would throw in there. Um, <laughs> Science Friday has been uh, very popular as well. Uh, just joining the silence recently and pulling in, pulling in, um, you know, somewhere between forty and eighty Second Life residents to their island uh, to interact with uh, Ira Flato, Ira Flatley in Second Life is his, his alter ego uh, during the show. And, and this is where we, we have this sort of new media for engaging science experts and science journalists with with the public. You might be wondering what comes next. Um, I recently read a NASA request for proposals where they're looking to try to build uh, a NASA game. Uh, and my, my ears uh, perked up when I first heard about it because I'm like, hey, university faculty using Second Life. Hey, great, I, I know all about that. Uh, but then I saw this part, familiar to the majority of students. And that is a myth. That is an absolute myth that uh, that most people believe that if you are under the age of 21 that you're completely familiar with all of these technologies that's simply not true uh, i've been doing this for several years with my own uh, students and roughly one tenth of them have heard of second life uh, and even after using it for an entire semester uh, about one tenth of them will be struggling and saying dr Kreider, this just doesn't make sense why are you having me go into a virtual world where there are furry people uh, what does that have to do with astronomy? And I try to chalk that up as a cultural learning experience that they got. 
uh, akin to going to a foreign country, which is actually pretty close to the truth. I've taken study abroad uh, classes to Mexico, and, and this is a little bit stranger than Mexico. Um, but this familiarity will, will, will change. Um, any of you play the Nintendo Wii? Heard of it? There's six million units of that sold, and, and everyone that, that's played that is familiar with the concept of the me, the little character that you make that represents yourself on the Nintendo Wii. Uh, but if you want to go further, you have things like webkins, where you buy a little stuffed animal. You go online. There are one million kids that have bought stuffed animals and registered them with this online website designed to be the, a scaled-back version of, of, of Second Life. Likewise, the intensely popular Club Penguin which, when I first heard about it, I'm like, what's so, what's so great about being a penguin? But you have four million kids uh, that all go in and pretend to be penguins talking to other penguins. <laughs> you, you think that's good? What, uh, Barbie girls. Girls don't go home and play with, with plastic Barbies. Uh, they, they go home, and 10 million girls every afternoon uh, go and pretend to be virtual Barbies talking to other virtual Barbies in an online world. This this is the future of, of, of our children communicating with each other. It's, the students that come to college today are not ready to go to the virtual world. They're, they're more like those of us in, in the audience. But when these elementary school kids and middle school kids come to college, they will be uh, fully aware of this technology, familiar with it, and expecting it. So let's imagine what that RFP, that request for proposal from NASA, should or could look like. Uh, have you ever heard of America's Army, a video game created by uh, the U.S. Army as a recruiting tool? It looks kind of like this. You have a gun and you shoot things. If you're going to make uh, retool that for NASA, you have a gun and you, well, no, we don't, <laughs> we, we don't want to do that. So we won't shoot things. Maybe we'll lay out science experiments like the solar wind collector. Or if people don't understand that, we can just go plant a flag. Uh, <laughs> then no, that... This is an interesting idea, and, I, and, and at one time I, I almost thought it was a good one. But the thing is, um, for those of us who are scientists, we, we do like to go and play games where we shoot things, but that's not what the part of our brain that in, engages with science. It, it, it's a little bit closer to this. I, I, I told a friend of mine that I was coming to speak at this panel, and uh, she picked me up a copy of Seed. <laughs> and on the back cover was this. Uh, a Second Life Island, which is one that I actually laid out for NASA about two years ago when NASA came into to Second Life and said, came to our museum and said, you guys are the experts on setting up uh, science education things. What should we do? And I said, well, uh, you want to set up something that kind of looks like the moon, but that people can build things uh, so they can build their own things. So in Second Life, we call that a sandbox. And, and they did. And the things that you see in this picture weren't built by NASA or paid for by NASA. NASA paid for the little plot of land and set up the thing that looked like a barren moonscape. But, but people that are interested in NASA would then come to that spot and build their own rockets and launch their own rockets and, and, and read about the blueprints of, of what might be the future of science and then build it there. This is the equivalent of Legos or erector sets uh, for the future. When I, I think the best example of it I, I can show you is this, which really doesn't look like much. But uh, what we're looking at here is a simulation of my simulation. that I built a recreation of the Apollo 11 landing site in full detail. And a kid that I know only as Joey uh, broke into Second Life, although it's illegal for anyone under 18 to be on the, the main grid of Second Life. He snuck in, because not because he wanted to see... Uh, vampire porn shops or anything like that, but he wanted, he wanted to interact with real scientists and engineers and to build things on his own. And what we're looking at is he built his own little version of an American flag and his own little version of a, of a telescope and his lantern. None of it quite, quite looked right, but he, w he was learning how to write the computer code and he was learning how to uh, do the, the, the building and the dimensions and the unit conversions that, he, that, that we would want any of our students doing in this sort of way. It, it's not uh, a matter of build it and they will come, but give them the tools to build it and they will. And, and that is really the future of, uh, of our virtual world education. Um, in real life, I'm Anthony Kreider. In Second Life, I'm Chaka Marula. If you, have, if you happen to be in the neighborhood, give me a ring. Thank you. <laughs>